Good day. Today is Thursday, September 12th, 2024. My name is Teresa Baker, and I will be your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Archetype Pattern Workshop Scripture Study class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of His eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder and dean, Dr. Henry Clipper Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Classes are held in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. This class in Fairmont, West Virginia, was started in November 2020. At this time, I would like to introduce to you our facilitator of this class, Dr. Dennis Pratt, and our secretary, Dr. Patty, Patty Deslin. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The true title of the Word of Son is Elohim. It has been improperly sub substituted with God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted with Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your, investigation on your part in any good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet with, that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English alphabet until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and of His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is spirit, as stated in 2 Corinthians 3.17, and in this state, he is inscrutable and incomprehensible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you 
that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal anthropomorphic being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form may only be seen in divine visions and understood by divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plains? A further understanding of this name and title may be obtained by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai, where he showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof to how everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of this class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, as stated in Acts 4 and 12, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10 
is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. We would like to begin this morning's class with a prayer by Dr. Lucy Altman. We have a song rendered uh, from Sister Samira Brass. And the scripture lesson is Revelation, the 21st chapter. And I'll be asking Dr. Joyce Van Hook if she would uh, read the scripture today. Yes. Thank you. And our readers for today are Dr. Lucy Altman and Dr. De Deborah Van Hook. May we have our prayer, please? Good day, class. Let's all take a moment and reflect on what we've learned, what's been revealed to us by Yahshua the Messiah, and take those things and apply them to our daily existence and see how Yahshua is operating in all things around us, in us, and through us. We've been given this great blessing to know his true name, the true name of salvation, which is Yahshua the Messiah, the name of the Father, Yahweh, divine title Elohim. Just that alone puts us so far ahead of the world in our knowledge and understanding when we know that within him we live, move, and have our being. We thank you, Yahshua, for giving us this wonderful teaching this great gospel, how you died and were buried and rose again the third day for our salvation. We thank you for the great sacrifice. We thank you for revealing to us the truth and taking us out of the world, out of the ignorance and darkness of all of our former beliefs. And we ask you to keep us strong and growing in knowledge and in faith and in wisdom that we may endure all things in these last days. For all these many blessings, we thank you, Yash. Thank you. Hallelujah. May we all hallelujah. say hallelujah. Praise Yahshua. Hallelujah. 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 See a hama kooka daily quickle. 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 See a hama. See a hama. See a hama kooka daily quickle. See a hama. See a hama. Ooh, see a hama kooka lady quicko. We are marching in the light of ya. We are marching in the light of ya. Uh, we are marching in the light of ya. We are marching in the light of ya. We are marching. We are marching. Ooh, we are marching in the light of the light of Yah. We are marching. We are marching. Ooh, we are marching in the light of Yah. Again, see a home, a daily quicko. See a home, a daily quicko. See a home, a daily quicko. We are marching in the light of Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Dr. Brass. That was beautiful. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey. All right. Hallelujah. Good morning, brethren. Good day, brethren. Good day. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Yes. I'll be reading Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, 
saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from Yahweh, out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw a great voice, I'm sorry, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Yahweh himself shall be with them and be their Eloah. And Yahweh shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is, is a thirst of the, of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his Eloah, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, de descending out of heaven from Yahweh, having the glory of Yahweh, and her light was like an unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had, go, had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length as, is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, a hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like, an unto, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardanus, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth, a topaz, the tenth, a, cris, a crisporus, the eleventh, a jacinth, and the twelfth, an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent to glass. And I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh El Shaddai and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of Yahweh did lighten it, 
and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the cities of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise, pardon me, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I've read to you Revelation chapter 21. Hallelujah. 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 Beautiful. We would like to, I would like to thank everyone for their participation this morning. I will now turn this class over to our facilitator, Dr. Dennis Pratt. Dr. Pratt? Good day. Good day, family. It's good to be here. I thank Joshua for assembling us and raising us unto this gospel to hear of him and increase in us his divine attributes, which he embodies in this ontological state, which we know he is spirit, and that in spirit and through spirit is all things materialized, including this creation. So we're thankful he's assembled us to once again look at this divine vision revelation given to our founder, Dean Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley, where he just stepped into that body and took it over on June 6, 1931, and made it clear that he himself is the vision of revelation. He is Yahweh in a body, and that that is a mystery and was a mystery unto the world, but we now know through Pentecost, he's proving to us in this current age that he is still pouring himself out into those who he's called by name. So we see that he is truly the Elohim, who is the archetype, original pattern of the entire universe, everything created in creation, the sum total of creation follows his pattern which he showed to Moses on top of Mount Sinai in a vision and how he instructed him to build it in the wilderness of Sinai, which is recorded in everyone's ancient script, that it consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout, three compartments, but yet one tabernacle pointing to the fact that he is a unity and not a trinity as the world once thought. Let's get Deuteronomy 6 and 4. And how he instructs us to understand him because he says Moses wrote of him. Let's get Isaiah 8 and 20. So we know that Moses wrote of him in the first five books known as the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the prophets witnessed and testified of him, drawing from the vision given to Moses. And today we are continuing to review how it is proven when John on the Isle of Patmos, the last apostle, the eyewitness to the Messiah fulfilling all these things, is confirming the vision given to Moses. So let's read Isaiah 8 and 20, and let's get Deuteronomy 6 and 4 to see that our Father is truly a unity and not a trinity. To the law and, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So that's Isaiah prophesying that it is to the law and to the testimony. So we know the law is the first five books mentioned. And the testimonies are the 34 books from Joshua to Malachi. That's going to witness to Yahweh being a unity. Let's read Deuteronomy now in the law 6 and 4. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh, our Elohim, is Yahweh a unity? So he calls us to hear. He says, hear, O Israel. And, and that is an important commandment because he's the one that gives us the permission to hear him and to know that today we are Israel because Israel is having power with El. Not according to whether you are Greek or Jew, but knowing that that Holy Spirit in you gives us the ability now 
to hear our Father's voice, to hear his name when he breathes in us, to know that this name Yahshua is Yahweh in a body as salvation. He says to hear him, O Israel. Read again. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is Yahweh a unity. That's right. So in this class today, we're going to continue with uh, in the school text that our father wrote, a four-volume text entitled Elohim, the archetype original pan of the universe. Archetype means original. Archetype is better pronounced. And it shows that when he says he's the original pattern, the pattern he's referring to is that threefold tabernacle pattern, that intangible threefold intangible tabernacle he showed to Moses, where he brought Moses upon Mount Sinai. And I say he brought Moses because Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, is actually Joshua in the body, who then transforms before him and the elders into this super incorporeal anthropomorphic being as shared in the moderation, having a shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And as Revelations 20, 21 shows us with John confirming it, it was a clear body, it outshined the noonday sun. And we see that he transformed and showed them that he is truly the Elohim that they know, the El Shaddai that came to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the almighty provider, and he's the one that delivered them out of Egypt. And if they had any doubt about that, he spoke it again when he took them over to Canaan's land in Joshua 24, where he declared himself to be the one that delivered them. And he's the same one that's delivering us now out of the state of darkness through his death, burial, and resurrection. He came down at the end of this age, this, this post-Diluvian age, where the Mosaic law was given, and he fulfilled what they could not in this law, nailed it to his cross and brought in everlasting salvation through his spirit. So we see here that in this anthropomorphic state, he then, through the power of transmutation, he's the same substance, he's just showing them that he's a pattern so that they can perceive that everything created is created by him, as we see his body here shaped in part, and that the creation by the pattern is created threefold. Every day of creation shown to Moses in Moses' vision is created in a threefold pattern. And so today we're seeing now the vision that Moses was given, confirmed by John in the school text. We are going to pick up in volume one. I believe page 70. Let's see. That's correct. Okay. John 1A. Yes, let me get to it first. Okay, so the section is entitled The Vision of Moses. And the Apostle John, this is Apostle meaning that he's been baptized with the Holy Spirit and he was a disciple walking with the Messiah. So he was an eyewitness. That's what Apostle means. And so the vision of Moses and the Apostle in comparative analysis or apostolic confirmation. So this is a confirmation. And, and when, when we see apostolic confirmation, remember that John is on the Isle of Patmos in AD 96. 63 years from AD 33 when the Messiah poured out his Holy Spirit. So again, in confirmation and fulfillment to how the Messiah came in as the 63rd generation of the flesh. And we looked at that just before class. So we, we may touch on that to show others how that can be proven. But we see the vision of Moses and the Apostle John in comparative analysis or apostolic confirmation of the creation of the old and of the new heaven and earth, of the old and of the new heaven and earth as pertaining to the purpose of Yahweh, which we'll look at the migratory pattern as John did showing how the old earth and the old heaven had passed away. And so let's begin reading on page 70. Where did we leave off Dr. Van Hook? We're, it's, we started John 1A on page 70. 
Okay, so let's begin there. John 1a. John, in his vision on the Isle of Patmos, heard the voice that spoke with him and turned and saw Elohim, who is as he understood him to be the resurrected and glorified sanctuary or temple in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks clothed with a garment down to the feet okay i couldn't see it. it's it's all together now down to the feet and gird about the paps with a golden girdle, which was typified by the garments of beauty and glory, and the ephod with 12 precious stones therein, worn by the high priest, and the furnishings of the tabernacle, and the golden overlaid covering of the temple with its interior furnishings. His hairs were white like wool, which were symbolized by the cloud that overshadowed the tabernacle and the cloud above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which typified the powerful effect of all the spoken words of Yahweh Elohim that expressed his purpose from beginning to the end including the words engraved in tables of stone with the finger of Elohim and laid in the Ark of the Covenant and the words written in the heart and mind by the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This was typified by the temple elevated on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, overlaid with gold and decked with precious stones and the sun light shining thereupon, sending this dazzling ray unto the brightness. Cloud Try it again. Not. Try it again. Sending, sending, it's it's dazzling, sending its dazzling rays unto the brightness could not be looked upon with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. His eyes were as a flame of fire, typified by the Shekinah, or light that flashed in the cloud between the wings of the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant. After the atonement was made for Israel, his feet were like unto fine brass, typified by the brazen altar and labor in the outer court the superincorporeal body of Elohim in Yahweh is the sanctuary or sanctuaries is the true excuse me, is, excuse me is the true sanctuary or sanctuaries of sanctuaries is the true, true sanctuary, sanctuary of sanctuaries of sanctuaries revelations 1 and 10 through 16 all right thank you so let's read that and then Dr. Van Helper, we want to go over this again slowly because this is, again, for those who may be new, this is reflecting what we've been shown in this divine vision revelation on what's known as the Moses chart, where we see the tabernacle pattern and its furnishings. And we rehearse it repeatedly because it's so important to see how even today, when we read this, I know most of us in our mind's eyes taken back to these furnishings to see how the reflection now is shown in John's vision on how Yahweh is truly the tabernacle or the sanctuary of sanctuaries, which we are. He says, know ye not that we are his temple bought with a price. And that's a beautiful thing to know. So let's go ahead and read Revelations 1, 10 through 16. I'm sorry, I was muted. That's okay. <laughs> Revelation 1 and 10. I was in the spirit on the Sabbath day and, be and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, 
what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the Senate assemblies which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behold, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the path with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet burned like unto brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Beautiful. Yeah. So now let's look at the divine vision revelation here. I want to pull up the chart because we did this on Tuesday. And so here we, and Yahshua has us right where he wants us, which is beautiful to understand, to really embrace the importance of understanding this tabernacle pattern, which he is, and the furnishings which he gave Moses and, and our founder and dean for us to know him by understanding these furnishings have certain materials that reflect a purpose in his purpose and his pattern and his plan, such as the brazen furnishings, which we know is now called the outer court or is a court without. And we understand that because as Revelations John talks of, those unbelieving uh, vessels of this honor are going to the lake of fire. It's, it's really that plain and simple and that this altar, this brazen altar of sin sacrifice is likened onto that lake or that state of fire. So we see in the court around about that our father has shown us that in his court, there are brazen vessels and these vessels look like gold because they're highly polished. You can see they're sometimes they're like a mirror. You know, if you if you polish brass so so much, it can it, it's been used in ancient times as mirrors to my understanding. But you have a brazen altar of sin sacrifice, where this was instituted with the Israelites to bring a sacrifice for their transgression. That sacrifice would take on a death, which is a principle here. So you see the blood of that sacrifice placed on the four horns of this altar. And all of this is so, all of this has a relationship with our Savior who has died for us and, and is, a, is a true acceptable atonement that was instituted here because the children of Israel could not, could not succeed in, in performing the 613 laws, ordinances, and commandments. So this was set up or instituted for them to see and for us, and, and, and as, a, as a figure, let's get that in Hebrews, I think it is, where the, they, the, 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 this tabernacle and its ordinances serve as a type and a shadow, a figure of the things here in this time with Israel where they could not, their, their unbelief caused them to perish in the wilderness of Sinai here. They were here for 40 years after being delivered from Egypt, after seeing, as John talks, the seven vials, the seven plagues brought on Egypt, and after seeing the signs and seeing how the Red Sea was parted, they followed a, an angel in a cloud. They see how, you know, the Creator comes down in a cloud and leads them, not, not follows them, as some versions indicate, but leads them, because again, Moses is writing of him, and leads them into a state known as a holy place, which he identified with Moses when he told him to take off his shoes. And in this state, he is commanding them to know him. He is giving them a covenant known as the Mosaic covenant, which is a relationship, it's a, a marriage. And they said, all that he said we will do. 
And here we see that the moment Moses gets up here in this fiery cloud, which they couldn't understand how he would survive it, not understanding Yahweh's purpose because the Holy Spirit is not in them, but understanding that they see that Moses enters atop of this mountain into this fiery cloud. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he's shown the divine vision and revelation of the creation of heaven and earth. And he's shown that in six days where the where the created and rests on the seventh and, and and sanctifies it and shows Moses now how to build the tabernacle pattern, which he is, you know, for the other 33 days before he's he's called out of this cloud and comes down and sees the children of Israel in disobedience. Or, or as in a marriage, just, 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 what's, what's the word, family? What are they doing? They're being adulterous. They're, they're turning to another, they're turning to a creation, such as a substance that's been molded into a calf and calling it their idol. They're calling it their savior. This is what delivered them, they call it. You know, and, and so Moses is hot. Because most and its purpose, just as with Adam, in his disobedience, he's being obedient and, and cast these first set of stones down and, and it breaks because they've broken the covenant. And so it's in the purpose of showing that, that they cannot, without the Holy Spirit, no one is, is brought presentable. No one can be brought presentable unto the Father. And so we see that without the Holy Spirit in them, they were just disobedient. And so in this tabernacle that they were given and they were instructed to build, and it took Yahweh entering these vessels, to build, entering the men and the women to, to, to bring the offerings and to construct the tabernacle. The tabernacle was constructed in 40 weeks, which points to a principle of, principle of 40. Because as we shared in the tabernacle, you have principles. And that first principle we spoke of was death, which is on the brazen altar, where that sacrifice is, is put to death for their transgression and the blood on the four horns of the altar. And then we see that there's a brazen labor, which contains water. It's a twofold um operation where the cleansing of the priest and the cleansing of the sacrifice is performed here. And it points to a principle of burial because you have to immerse yourself to cleanse the sacrifice and yourself. And it points to an immersion or a baptism. So you have death, you have a burial, which is like an unto an immersion. And then at the door of this tabernacle, you have a cup of holy anointing oil. And this oil was poured on the high priest when he begins to officiate in this tabernacle. So it points to spirit, giving him the permission to enter into this holy place and to officiate in type and shadow as a priest, a high priest. So we see death, burial, resurrection, which resurrects him into this holy place. And so when we look at the migratory pattern, the same principle applies. You see the blood of the Paschal Lamb, which points to a death of that lamb, and that that blood is placed on the four points of the door. You have the lentil, two side posts dipping from a basin. Four points of blood, again, correlating to the fact that the Father says it is by blood, he says, and it's through the shedding of his blood that, as it was shared in the prayer, that saves us and and to know that it's only his blood that was sufficient as the atonement to atone for the sins of the world so we see it instituted here which means to begin an event and he finishes it here with his death burial and resurrection on this cross we see after this blood is placed in this door we see that they consume the lamb and they are in, and they're in readiness to depart their faith is in readiness because they know that their deliverer is present. And so they follow this miraculous cloud. Let's get that in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10. How uh, they're baptized, you know, in the cloud and in the sea, which we see it points to water. So now you are by the brazen labor 
which correlates to the brazen labor in the tabernacle where there's water and where there's an immersion. And this cup of anointing all points to that Holy Spirit, you know, that's anointing them and, and resurrecting them into the wilderness of Sinai or the holy place. Let's get that in Corinthians. I'm sorry, Doc, what was the uh, verse? Or baptized in the sea. Yes, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual food and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was the Messiah. So we know that rock led them, and we know it led them all the way here into the wilderness and continued to lead them through their journey here in the wilderness as that cloud. That cloud sat in the most holy place, and they saw it as, as it was a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of a fire by night. And so we see that cloud when they came, when this high priest came up here once a year, that this cloud would emanate a flash of light, which we know is correlated to what happens when a child is conceived in a body. And that was not known until recently that that conception or that flash of light correlates to the Messiah here on his mercy seat, giving mercy to the children of Israel to the high priest and his family, and for the atoning of this tabernacle. So we see that in the holy place, there are furnishings of gold, a golden seven-branched lampstand, a golden table of shoe bread, and a golden altar of incense. These are golden vessels, which points to the Holy Spirit ministering in vessels, giving light, sustenance, and mediation. So we see the principle here of 40 because it, it's 40 weeks in the building. It is also said that these vessels are 10 feet apart. As you head from the door to the lampstand, it's 10 feet. 10 feet from the lampstand to the altar of incense. 10 feet from the altar of incense to the table of shoe bread. 10 feet from the table of shoe bread to the door. So you have 10, 20, 30, 40. Again, four is the principle. Of, of what we are talking about because it points to the Messiah coming in and zero are placeholders. He is coming in at the end of the 4,000 year where he has instituted events where only he can fulfill it, which he does and nails it to his cross, putting an end to sacrifices, baptisms, and knowing that it's through a promise of faith that he's bringing in a fulfillment through the Holy Spirit that's poured out by faith in us at the end of this age. We are now at the end of this age where he is doubling that measure in us, increasing us as he did with the Israelites in preparation for the close of this age. We are in the fourth age known as the present kingdom age. And there are three ages to come where we'll be learning of him and in a, a state of immortality. Let's get that, 1 Corinthians 15 and 53. That after this mortal coil is dissolved and everyone must come to its first death, everyone's appointed to die at least once. Let's read that. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's right. Okay. So we see Paul reiterating that to the believers in Corinthians. So let's return to the school text. And so we read Revelations 1, 10 through 16. And we said we're going to reread this section again slowly while I get the uh, chart up. Let's see. The chart is on. Here we go. Okay, Dr. Van Hook. You're reading from the book. You're reading from your book. Okay. John 1A. John, in his vision on the Isle of Patmos, 
heard the voice that spoke with him and turned and saw Elohim, who is, as we understand him to be, the resurrected and glorified sanctuary or temple in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks clothed so with the a garment. resurrected and glorified temple. So when you see, when we see this divine vision where he is in the garments of beauty and glory and we see Moses sees him and, and shows us in the vision where he's naked, he has come into his fulfillment of his garments, which we are, which is reconciling us back onto him. We are his garments of beauty and glory. He is pouring his Holy Spirit now as we sit in our seats and increasing that oil that increases in this lamp. He's increasing us with a light because he is, let's get that in, in the scripture, that he is the light that gives light to, to us. He's the, he is, he says, I am the light. And I believe he says that in John. John 1, 14. Mm -hmm, let's get that. And that he's the light of life. John, first chapter. Uh, let's get 8 and 12. Verse 8. He was not, this is referring to John, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Mm -hmm. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Mm -hmm. He came unto his own tribe, and his own received him not. Mm -hmm. But as many as received him, to him gave he power to become the sons of Yahweh, even to them that believe on his name. Beautiful. Right. And we have the other verse where he says, I am the light. I think that's in 8, John 8 and 12. Yeah, Joshua said, I am the light. John 8 and uh, 12. Then spake Joshua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's why we're here assembled. He's called us to live, to live in him and to know that he's the one that gives us the light of life. So we are so thankful always to be reminded and to see the confirmation, which is what we're reviewing, the um, comparative vision given to Moses being confirmed by John the Revelator. Let's keep reading clothed with a garment down to the feet and gird about out the paps with a golden girdle, which was typified by the garments of beauty and glory and the ephod with 12 precious stones therein worn by the high priest and the furnishings of the tabernacle and the golden overlaid covering of the temple with its interior furnishings. His hair's were white like wool, which were symbolized by the cloud that overlaid the tabernacle and the cloud above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which typified the powerful effect of all the spoken words of Yahweh. You know what just jumped off this page on me? Look at the look at the divine vision revelation. You said a sharp two-edged sword. And you know, I've I've seen this this illustration of Yahweh speaking the Ten Commandment law. And I know there were thunderings and lightnings. We can get that scripture. But for him to say, for John to say a sharp two-edged sword, you know, this to me looks like a two-edged sword to me. I don't know if it's it does the same to you but it shows how his word is a sharp two-edged sword. And we know that this commandment abides in us now. We saw, we went through that on Tuesday in our most holy place in the head cavity, how there's a pituitary gland that commands the body. And it has a posterior and anterior side to it that emits the 10 hormones. Do we have that with Moses? 
Um, oh. Where are you looking for the two-edged sword? I don't see it. Okay, it was just read in the school text. What we're showing is how with Moses, when Yahweh spoke to the children of Israel, I think, I believe that's in Exodus 19 or 20. I think it's 20, where he's speaking the Ten Commandments law. You see the illustration, Dr. Lewis, that Dr. Kenley shows us how Yahweh's spirit manifesting within the cloud. Do you yes. see that? Yes. Okay, do you see the mouth that's illustrated where he is speaking the Ten Commandment law? Do you see that? Oh, yeah. Yes, I see that. Now, what uh -huh. do you see at be between that Ten Commandment law and his mouth? What do you see? What do you see illustrated? Looks like lightning bolts, right? Yes. Okay. Well, it can also look like swords or two-edged swords. Hmm. Yeah, something to think about. It's just something that jumped off me when read that again, Dr. Van Hook, that Dr. Henry left with us. Hold on before she say that, Dr. Uh, Dennis Pratt, because when you said the two edged sword, where you have the number one pointing to Elohim, and then on the other side, it's like pointing to John. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have arrows everywhere on this chart, like one, two, and three, two A, one A. At first, I thought you was going to be referring to those as swords. No. Okay. And that's I, mean, what I was referring it. I was looking at it uh, from one, from the mouth one, and from John on the Isle of Patmos. Mm -hmm. So three points as a two edged sword. But so I can also see this again. principle too. Yeah, I because it's coming principles. from mouth. That's the point. That's why okay. I want to be read again. It's okay. coming from a mouth. So this is a mouth being illustrated. Right, yes. that's Yahweh in pure spirit, and he and let's see what what's read, what's recorded for us to see. Out of his mouth went a two, excuse me, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which mm -hmm. typified the powerful effect of all the words spoken by Yahweh Elohim. The words spoken by him, and are these Elohim. not commandments? Or we you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, words, his words. So I just, I just like I said, it just jumped off the page. I wanted to share with the assembly. It's just to me beautiful. Yeah, I, see, I see the That's correlation, okay. Doctor Pratt. I yes. see the correlation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's go back to the school text. Did you want Hebrews four and twelve, Doc? Yes, the figure. Oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's the pituitary gland in the Romans 1, 19 and 20 doing the same thing for the body. It is a discerner. It knows what hormone to admit. It is, the, it is the master gland of the body. So it's just, again, Yahweh just is just beautiful. So he's just manifesting and showing us how, how real he is and how John, who is confirming this divine vision and revelation, is showing us that when he appeared to Moses in the state that we see looking like a naked state, it's really a mystery and that this mystery is now being revealed, which is to reconcile us unto himself in these garments of beauty and glory, which were in type and shadow given to the high priest to officiate in this tabernacle. Any questions or comments on that? That's beautiful. It is. Yeah, I, 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 I would comment and say this, um, Dr. Pratt, that mm -hmm. that's a beautiful correlation. And I like how, um, uh, uh, Dr. Almond went to Hebrews 4 and 12, which is really in reality of uh, what the correlation that you're showing with the mouth, with the law in the mouth and the word spoken, which is the word spoken, um, correlating the correlation. It, it, it's a beautiful correlation. Mm -hmm. And I thank Yashua for that. I've heard it and seen it before, but we always like repetition, and I'm glad that you emphasized it. Hallelujah. 
It is a beautiful, beautiful principle. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so Dr. Van Hook, you're still reading and we'll keep the chart up. Did you want me to read that start, that sentence again? Yes, and yeah, no problem. Repeat that again. That's just beautiful to me. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, mm -hmm. which typified the powerful effect of all the words of Yahweh Elohim that expressed his purpose from beginning to the end, including the words engraved in tables of stone with the finger of Elohim and overlaid in the Ark of the Covenant, and the words written in the heart and mind was typified by the Holy Spirit under the New Covenant. That's right. His now, to no, pause right there, because that's a good point to pause on, because that's where the fulfillment is, is now in our hearts and minds, um, and that this was a type and shadow typified here in the tabernacle pattern. Dr. Baker, your hand is up. Yes, sir. I'm, I apologize. I lost my place on what page where we're reading. 71. Yep. Okay, I'm on 71. I just lost my place. Yeah, top of page 71, volume one, for those coming in afterwards. We're in the section, the vision of Moses and the apostle John. In comparative analysis, or con right. apostolic confirmation of the creation of the old and of the new heaven and earth as pertaining to the purpose of Yahweh. Okay, I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. I apologize for the interruption. Okay, we're a class. We're here for everybody. All right. Could we have that read again, please? That is beautiful. Yeah, we can definitely read that again for sure. Out of his mouth when a sharp two edged sword which typified the powerful effect of all the spoken words of Yahweh Elohim that expressed his purpose from beginning to the end, including the words engraved in tables of stone with the finger of Elohim and laid in the Ark of the Covenant and the words written in the heart and mind by the Holy Spirit. Under this new covenant, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This is typified by the temple overlaid, excuse me, elevated on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, overlaid with gold and decked with precious stones. Let's and the sunlight there. shining. Okay. Yeah, let's pause there. Dr. Uh, Dr. Samara Brass. Your hand yes, I've heard it said, I don't know if it's in the Bible or not, but uh, I would like to know. It says in, I've heard, uh, it cuts uh, a two-edged sword, cuts going in, and it cuts coming out. Is there any reference to that or any meaning mm -hmm. does it have? So I know it says how it cuts. Let's go there. I think it's Hebrews 4 and 12. The word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper let's get that and let's get that ready the two-edged sword and it's piercing and it will show you how it cuts so let's get it according to scripture in hebrews 4 and 12. hebrews 4 12 for the word of yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it can divide soul and spirit. He says, fear not the one that can kill the flesh, but the one that can destroy the soul. He can divide it. As he, let's read that again. That's, that's important. Because this is him speaking, and it's in him, it's in us that he's speaking, how he's letting us know that it's through him that we are able to resurrect once this mortal coil is dissolved. What and scripture is that? I'm sorry. That's Hebrews, Hebrews 12 four and 12. Yeah. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of thunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner. <coughs> Excuse me and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Mm -hmm. 
Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Alton. So does that help, I hope, Dr. Samara Brass? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Can we just go ahead and read down the next couple of our verses, please? Thank okay, you. Let's get, let's get the verse so we can have everybody on board with that and see it. His countenance hold on, was as hold, hold, hold that thought. Hold the thought. Let me get the, the scripture out for everybody. So let's get Hebrews 4, 12. And you want to read continuing or you want to start from the beginning? Let's start from 4 and 12. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful hmm? and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yahshua, the son of Yahweh, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tested like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thank you. So that, who was that, Dr. The Dr. Edna Mixon? Mixon? That was Edna Mixon? Yes, that's me. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you on Hello. the show. All right, yes, so what you, you want to take expound here in the reading of <laughs> the scriptures? But there's a, there's a good thing that Dr. Altman did and not reading tempted. She mm -hmm. said tested because we know the Holy Spirit cannot be tempted, right? And we That's know right. it's tested, yeah. So that was a that was good reading there. But what did you want to yeah. bring up? My point was I just wanted her to go all the way down because when I looked up the two-edged sword, it says read 4 and 14 on down oh. uh, when I uh, researched it on my phone. Okay. So that's why I said, can she just continue to the end? And okay. thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's all good. So we see how it even correlates to that pituitary gland that can that can hit the joints, know what's going on in the marrow is a discerner. So we have a Romans 1, 19, and 20 that Paul is reminding us how quick, because those hormones respond quicker than light to, to address any concerns in the body. So Yahweh is showing us how he's made us according to his pattern and that he's, we're operating you know, according to his purpose. It talked about heavens, and I wanted to touch on that real quick as a review for some and new for others. How many heavens are there? Who knows that answer? Three. Yes. According to the tabernacle pattern. Three. That's we have three. There are three heavens. Three. And we know how to prove that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right, good. All right, so I don't want to digress. I just, that came up and I was like, okay, we're in class. Let's review that real quick. All right, so Dr. Van Hook, you may continue, please. Do I, we have, oh, excuse me. I have oh, another point because I, I'm i looking on my phone, the definition of the double-edged sword, and it is the reading a uh, situation or course of action having both positive and negative effects. Mm hmm That's true. There are curses and blessings. It's a two-edged sword. And he showed us in Deuteronomy, I think it's 26, how uh, he'll bring curses or blessings. He showed it in Egypt that how the first three plagues affected Israel and the Egyptians, but that's the seven plagues, which John refers to, the seven vials were poured out just to Egyptians. So it has a twofold effect. Yes. Dr. Burris has a comment. Yes, Dr. Burris. Uh, 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 I had a question. We, do we have a new person at all? Because speaking of the three heavens, that 
if we have a new person, they may not understand that. Uh, no, to my understanding, there's no new people today. Okay. That's why they go into Jacob's ladder. But I just asked the question to the assembly is they, they know how to prove the three heavens besides pointing to the pattern, but how to go to the scripture and, and it will show. Let's go to the scripture since we're talking about it. <laughs> and let's see how uh, the scriptures refer to a third heaven, how he sees angels. He how No, Paul speaks of it, how he knows a man, whether in or out of the body, going to the third heaven. That's the first scripture reference. Let's get that. And in the law, it talks about other states being heavens. And it, and actually in the school text, we'll see the old heaven and the old earth being referred to as Egypt being passed away. So that's a good point, Dr. Burr. So let's get that. Uh, would Is you that in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter? 2 Corinthians, Corinthians the, I'm sorry. That's right, Second Corinthians, yes. the 12th chapter. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 12. Two. 12 and 13, 12 and 13, I believe. Uh, well, let's try two. 12 and 2. I'll start at one. Uh, mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 12, 1. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of Yahweh. I knew a man in the Messiah more than 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, Yahweh knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. Mm -hmm. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, Yahweh knoweth, how that he was caught up into glory and heard unspeakable words, which it is not possible for a man to utter. Okay, so where it's referred to third heaven, and we have a tabernacle plan, which is a key of knowledge, and we know there are three compartments. If it's referring to a third heaven, we know there has to be a second and a first heaven, because we know there are three compartments in this tabernacle. So that's one of the verses that speaks about heaven. Um, we can also look, let's look at, uh, let's see if we can go to. Uh, Revelation go about to the old, no, let's old go to heaven has passed away. Yeah, we're going to get there in just a minute, but I wanted to come down. So let's go to Psalms 33. And uh, where's my glasses? Is that five or fifteen? <laughs> Psalm thirty-three and six. Yeah. Okay. Psalm thirty-three and six. Mm -hmm. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made, and the heavens, were the host no, it's of plural. You see, the heavens were made by the word of Yahweh, and we know the heavens or the word of Yahweh, which is spirit, is where matter, all matter, is materialized. So we see, according to Him, who is the Word. He's made all the heavens, which includes the first heaven, which is known as the poor roundabout, the terrestrial plane. You have then the holy place, the celestial heaven, or the second heaven. And then you have the third heaven, eternity. All right, Dr. Baker, your hands up. Yes, what was the scripture that you referred to the, you correlated with the first heaven down in the court roundabout? Psalm 33 and 6. He says the word of Yahweh, by right. the word of Yahweh, were the heavens, plural, made. Okay, and, and then you got Second Corinthians 12 and 2. That's right. That's yeah. the third heaven. Yeah. I don't see where the second heaven. Okay, listen to what I'm saying again. So in the heavens, plural, that's referred to in David and Psalms, he's saying the word of Yahweh made the heavens were the heavens made heavens plural so it's right. not just the third heaven now we know that because he's shown us a pattern it is by a pattern that the other heavens are made if there's a third there's a second and there's a first according to himself you understand what i'm saying 
It yeah. doesn't say literally that the outer court is the first heaven. If that's what you're looking for, you're not going to see that literally said. But okay. you'll see how the word heavens plural. Now, he, he shows us in Paul that there's a third heaven, how a man ascended to the third heaven. Well, we know that okay. you have to ascend from the first and second compartments to get to the third okay. heaven. So I put in there uh, Dr. Trail Johnson from uh, Meridian, but Nehemiah 9 and 6 as a reference as well. Okay, so let's get that. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Here it is. Nehemiah 9 and 6. Okay. Nehemiah 9 and 6. Thou, even thou art Yahweh alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Beautiful, yeah. sir. Thank you so much. That's why we're a class. See, you just Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Together. That's right. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh huh. So that's Nehemiah 9 and 6, another strong reference when it comes to including the earth plane as a heaven. We see that he's the heavens of heavens he's made. And he describes it and lists it out as the earth and all that therein is. So that's beautiful. Thank you, sir. All right. So we are, let's see. We are still reading, Dr. Van Hook. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This was typified by the temple elevated on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, overlaid with gold and decked with precious stones, and the sunlight shining, shining thereupon, sending its dazzling rays unto the brightness, could not be looked upon with the naked eye. His eyes were as a flame of fire, typified by the Shekinah or light flash flashed in the cloud between the wings of the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant after the atonement was made for Israel. His feet like unto fine brass, typified by the brazen altar and labor in the outer court, the superincorporeal body of Elohim. In Yahweh is the true sanctuary or sanctuaries Revelations 1 and 10 through 16. So that oh, super incorporeal body of Elohim, which we see here illustrated, in Yahweh is the true sanctuary of sanctuaries. So we know when we see the, and look at the elementary chart where it says sanctum of sanctorum, we see how John is confirming it with us. Where's my elementary chart? Here we go. And we see sanctum of sanctorums, how it is his purpose to reconcile us here again unto himself, who is a true, who is our true sanctuary. And, and understand that the unbelievers, that's read in Revelations 21. Uh, let's get that section again. Uh, 21, where he speaks uh, the fearful and unbelieving in verse 8. Dr. Sybil Lewis had her hand raised. Okay, just a minute. Revelations 21 and 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and all lives shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we see how it correlates in this out of court, why it's called an out of court or the court without. Because here in this present age, we see that there are those who are pushing to restore carnal ordinances, which is calling the Messiah a liar because the scriptures say he fulfilled it. 
Let's get that in Matthew, where he says he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, which means perform it to its end. And so with those who are pushing for carnal ordinances to be restored and are leading those in darkness, have their part in the lake of fire. Let's read that. Matthew 5, 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yard or the smallest part of a letter shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Beautiful. So someone's hand was raised. Who was it, Dr. Baker? I just have two comments. Okay, uh, Dr. Lewis. Yes, I appreciate you going to that plate on the elementary chart, and it's also on the 40 plate chart, the sanctum of sanctorums, because when we read Revelation, the first chapter, talking about um, Yahshua, we'll see. I, I like this 40, the 40 plate because it's it's bigger and it shows exactly look at it uh the candlestick or the 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 lampstand and Yahshua, and it's talking about him so and i noticed that they have a, a face on that but I, I won't go into that but anyway i think this is a greater uh bigger depiction of uh revelation first chapter um image wise um so I'm glad you pointed that out. The other comment is that I always like to, uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, the third heaven, you had reference uh, Corinthians, where the apostle, I think it's the fifth chapter maybe, uh, where uh, Paul was saying that he was caught up to the third heaven. And we also know that by this vision and revelation that was given to our founder, he also referenced himself as being caught up to the third heaven, which we know pattern wise is the most holy place because, and you were talking about, mentioned that Dr. Pratt, where we see uh, the three heavens on the pattern uh, the first heaven being the court around the bout, the second heaven being the holy place, and the third heaven is the most holy place, pattern-wise. That can also be broken down as far as space, atmosphere, but I'm not going that way. I just want to make it very simple. That is according to the pattern. And so we see that the Apostle Paul he said he was caught up to the third heavens where he saw things and heard things that was not lawful for man to utter. And we know that those things are being uttered now by the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is speaking through these vessels whom he has, whom Yahweh has ordained. And so our founder in this fourth age, the end of this fourth age, we see that the vision is still speaking. He was said he was caught up to the third heaven. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Good to see you and hear your voice. Let's get Genesis 28 and 10. She said um, a ladder and it crossed my mind. I'm thankful for Nehemiah. Um, let me look at that again. That's Nehemiah. That was, what was that again? It's Nehemiah 6, right? So that's a good oh, strong God. reference there. Nine and six. Nine and six. And six. And let's get Genesis 28 and let's read 10 through 22. Where we have to see that there's that Yahshua is showing us in the law that there's a ladder. You know, um, let's get Genesis 10 and let's start. No, 28. I'm sorry. Wrong one. Genesis 28 and 10. Yeah. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place, 
and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. And behold, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. That's fine. That's the point I wanted to get to, how we see. We know that just as the tabernacle pattern we're given is likened onto a ladder. And we see that when we see the compartments and the veils that typify a rung on the ladder. We see with the computer being cooperative or not, we see that it's three compartments and that each compartment, when you when you enter the gate, you're ascending as the Day of Atonement, you're ascending all the way to the top. So you're, you, you're, you're it's likened onto a ladder, if you can see that with rungs on it, or or we know a departmental veil that separates the compartments from the court round about with the first veil separating it from the holy place to the second veil which separates it from the holy place to the most holy place. It is likened onto a ladder, or as Dr. Kenley would show us, a wreath, that a measuring rod. So we see that too as a ladder or a rule a ruler that that's a measuring rod for us to understand and see Yahweh operating in his purpose. All right. Any other comments before we go back to the reading? Yes. In verse 12, uh, 28, 12 of Genesis, it also uh, says it reached to the heavens, plural. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Alden. Okay, Dr. Van Hook. For John wrote, in Revelations 11, 1 through 3, thusly, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of Elohim and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit, excuse me, and the Holy City shall they tread uh, underfoot 40 and two months. And I will give power. Let's pause there for a minute. Okay. That's a very powerful <laughs> statement. Okay. So we don't have any first time visitors. So I want to say some things. And if you don't know how to prove it, I see that with the biggest hands up. I want us to get the scripture on how we know 42 months. It's a prophetic proof of three and a half years. And I'm going to give you the clue of 1260. Daniel prophesied of how they would trample this body. Yahshua gave Daniel the word came unto him to show that in, 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 in a prophetic sequence of days, days, and the, I'm sorry, time, times, and dividing of times, how it points to the Gentiles doing this. Uh, Dr. Baker. Yes, I was just going to mention what you just said, that 40 and two months is the three and a half years that Yahshua right. preached. That's right. And your scripture reference is? I think it's in Daniel. I'm not sure, but it's in Revelation as well. That's right. It is. In I don't have it off the time I'm top of my head, but I do remember reading it in Daniel and Revelation for 1260 days mm -hmm. equals that as well. So let's see if the scripture readers can help us with that. Is it 7 and 25 or is it 9 in the Holy Name Bible? Daniel. So let's, uh, it's Revelation 5 in one version and it's 7 and 25 in the other. Okay. So it's yes, 9 and 25, I think, in the Holy Name. But I mean, 24 and 9, I think. In the holy name. In the holy name is the 70 uh, years, mm -hmm. 70 weeks of years. So we we're looking at Daniel. Yes. In what chapter? Is it seven it's and nine, 25 and four, one? Seven. And five and 25 in the other? 
Also, it's in Revelation. Also, it's in Revelation 11 and 3. So let's go to Daniel 5. I don't see it in Daniel 7. 9, 24. 9 and 24. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And then he, Revelation 11 and 3. Daniel 9 and oh. 24. No, this is not it. That's I want not, times. That's not it. I want time, times, and dividing of times. That's the key expression that uh -huh. we're looking for. It's um, Revelation 12 in the Holy Name Bible, verse 15. All right, well, but right I think it's verse 14 in the King James. Okay. Revelation we... 12 and 15. Before we go to Revelation, let's go to Daniel. I'm trying to find it in Daniel, and I... Are you in holy name or king? Daniel 7, in... 7, 25. Okay, thank you. Daniel 7. Thank you, Terrell. And 25. Okay, let's start here. 7 and 25. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many. Echo I think it's five, verse 5 in the King James. I mean, chapter 5 in the King James. I don't mean to confuse anybody. I apologize. Yeah, I'm excited I'm seeing, right now. Uh, in the King James Version, I'm seeing 7 and 25 King James Version. All right. Let's okay. Go on, okay. Daniel. Daniel. And that's 7 and 25 or 5 and 25? Seven and twenty-five. All right, and the King James to say a seven. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Daniel seven twenty-five, King James version. Someone want to read? Daniel seven twenty-five, and King James. Shall speak and great shall... words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into His hands until a time and times and the dividing of time all right so dr samara brass i want you to start it again and say where you're reading from please i'm reading from the uh king J uh king james version of the bible mm -hmm. daniel 7 and 25 mm -hmm. and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and times I got it. I got it. Okay. So, I'm saints. done. I'm quiet. <laughs> Instead of saints, we know it's sons, Dr. Brass. I Thank you very that. much. My okay. correction. That's and fine. he shall speak great words against the Most High mm -hmm. and shall wear out the sons of the Most High mm -hmm. and think to change times and laws. And we just mentioned that carnal ordinances being restored, right? So we're in those times. As a prayer indicates how it's important to have that faith to keep us steadfast in these times where they're changing. Even now, October 2nd is going to be marked as a change in their calendar, uh, in the Hebrew calendar, which we know is inaccurate because the scripture says April or Abib is the month of the change. But they're going to note it, you know, in October. So this event is happening now. So continue reading where it says, and they shall be given, Dr. Brass. Okay, uh, and uh, they will wear out the sons of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Mm -hmm. And they shall be given unto his hands until a time and times and the dividing of time. So when we look at times or time, uh, in certain cultures, a time would refer to 300, and I'm going to see if I can do this here, 300 and a year, or 360 days, or 12 months. So this is days, this is months, and this is a year. Okay, that's not a good one, but that's, so that's days, months, and years okay and then so that's a time 
Uh, oh, yeah, we'll put it here. Time. That's a time. All right. This is, I can do better, but I'm practicing too. All right. So now we have a time. And then he says, time times. We see with an S. I'll get to you in just a minute, Camilla. We have times, which is plural. So you're multiplying time by what? Two. So two times 360 is what? 720. 720. All right. Remember, the goal here we're looking at is 42 months. So 720, two times 360, two times 24. I'm sorry, two times 12. Yeah, I just 24. said 24. 24. And then two times one is two. So that's times, right? Mm. And then what's the last expression? Half times. Right, dividing of times. The dividing of times, so that would be half of 360, which is what? 180. 180. Okay. Half of 12. Six. Six, that's right. And half of one is one half. Uh, mm -hmm. You wasn't quick to say anything, Deborah. I'm sorry. No, I was just I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at all of your all of your scribblings. Oh, uh, scribbling. Is it scribbling? Yes. Okay, you'll get your turn on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to add now, right? So yes. this is a dividing of times. I don't think I need to write that there. Hopefully everyone's following along. So when you add the column for years, you get what? It should be a familiar number. That's three and a half. Three and mm -hmm. a half years. You know, that's pointing to the Messiah's ministry. When you're adding the months that we just spoke of, where the they will trample down the Gentiles and the outer court has been left out for how many months? What does this add to? The, the 42. 42. And then we add this figure, and this is 1260. Yes. Which comes up in Revelations. Get that for me, Teresa. You had it. I need you to pull yes. it in. Yes, I have it. It's Revelation 11 and verse 3. Mm -hmm. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So we see the prophecy here being fulfilled because we know a score is 20. So three score is 60. So 1,260 days. And right. we see that the out of court is fulfilled with the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection because he says he gave it to Daniel to prophesy confirming it in Moses' vision that he would be that salvation and that those rituals in that out of court will come to an end. And we see he performed it in three and a half years. All right, Camilla, you're up. Okay, oh, I'm a little okay. I'm a little slow. Um okay. I thought that we were um um giving scriptures proving um the three heavens. We did that already. Okay, I said I was slow. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So we want to help Camilla out and give her some of the scripture references. No, I mean, that's okay, but I thought we were still doing it. No, no, we just went through the three heavens according to the tabernacle pattern. We looked at Paul seeing someone in and out of the body who was sent to the third heaven. And then we went to Jacob and saw the ladder that was set okay. up on the earth. Yeah, showing the three heavens, the ascending and descending. Okay. Okay, so, but this will be posted this evening for review. So right, right, right. An opportunity to look at it again. Okay. I will. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So we see that we were reading in the school text. Oh, let me take off the annotator. I can't do anything without that. Mm -hmm. I think know. Dr. Burris had her hand up as well. Okay. I had my hand up, but I took it down because uh, I don't want to uh, take up too much time. And I forgot part of what uh, I was going to ask. So thank you anyway. Okay. If it comes back, Dr. Burris, you know, just put your hand up. We'll get okay. to you as possible. Glad to have you on board. 
Any concerns or questions on what was discussed so far? Well, I do have some concern about what we, you all were just going through with the time. But again, the question I had left me in. You all have to excuse me. I'm trying my best to, to uh, hang in here. I love this teaching. Mm -hmm. I, it means so much to me. And uh, I'm just sorry I, I, I'll get a headache and forget stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm just let me get what I can get. Yashua's got my back. That's right. Yes, That's right. That's right. And as I shared before, and I'll share it again, I do what I can to get the each class um, processed through the copyright systems and everything so we get it posted by at least 6 Eastern time on the YouTube channel, Archetype Pan Workshop here in Mount West Virginia. So it's usually up by then for review. So, uh, Dr. Samara Brass, I saw your hand was raised. Yes, I, I can't move because I keep getting stuck in the um, in the holy place. When uh, we're speaking about the light, I am really trying to understand why we're using candles instead of what the lampstand actually had in it was oil. Okay. And what's okay. the significance of that? If it's not important, then I wonder why we continue to say candle, you know, stand or whatever. Okay. So what's the significance of the oil versus candle light? Okay, good question, which we did review recently in, in this class. Um, the short version is that in the scriptures, when this is when this furnishing is created. This is it is referred to as a seven seven branch golden candlestick, and that on top is the lamps where the oil is poured and the wick is lit. So it's not it's it, it's important to understand and distinguish when it's pointing to the seven branch candlestick when it's described when it's built. Let's look at that in um let's get Exodus twenty five and thirty one. It's referring to this area that's being built out of pure gold as a candlestick. And if you look at it, that's what it is. It's a, it's it's holding, it's it looks like a candlestick, but it's actually it's a stand. Just like you have a candlestick holder, mm -hmm. it's likened onto that. And then we see in other scriptures how the tops are prepared as lamps with the oil and the wick which is what's lit at three in the evening. First, let's get Exodus 25, 31 out of the law. And let's get First Chronicles 28 and 15 out of the prophets. May I say something about that? I, I don't have the a resource to, to rem, uh, remember exactly, but Dr. Brass, before, for uh, the oil, if my memory is, is not fading me on this, before the oil was used in the lampstand, the candles were came before that. They were made up of a formula before just the simple oil was used. And it can be found in some old uh, encyclopedias, how the candles were made. And I think it started out being the candle and then went to the oil. Well, I'm sure of that. I just can't tell you now what it was made of, you have to research that. Okay, so when I'm thinking, maybe I need a correction. Maybe when I'm thinking of candles, I'm thinking of wax. I don't know, maybe candles could be any substance, but 
uh, my mind goes right to wax. And I'm, I'm like, if we're using wax, then how does wax and, and oil, you know, I, I believe it's just a variation in the translations of lampstand, Thank candlestick. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, the principle is the light. Whether right. we call it a lampstand or a candlestick, it's a principle of light. Right. And we know that it's the oil, and that oil is showing us Yahshua, that spirit. And he is May the I light. Share yes, ma'am. That's true. Uh, I was just trying to let her know that the reason the uh, old Bible, some of them say candles, is because the candles actually were made back way back in time before the oil was was used to pour. I read that in some old encyclopedia from back in the day. Okay, so let's get That's Exodus right. 25 and 31, because this is what we looked at before, which we we're going to review, review again. So we can understand that the terminology or the expression is true, but we have to understand in context what it's referring to. Mm -hmm. And so this is a stand. Yes. When it talks about the beaten work, the candle, seven branch candlestick of one beaten work, this is the candlestick holder, so to speak, mm -hmm. that we're looking at and that we have, and it's the scripture is going to show us in Chronicles how there are lamps here that's lit, that has the oil with the wick. So we see that both expression is true, but to understand it, when it's recorded or when it's expressed in what context is being expressed. So in Exodus 25, here's where Moses is instructed how to build the candlestick, the seven branch candlestick of one beaten work, Exodus 25 and 31. Exodus 25, 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. Its base and its shafts, its bowls, its knobs, and its flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three candlestick out of the other. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. We don't need to go too much further. I just wanted Dr. Brass to get the reference in Exodus that we're talking now that the Holy Spirit is showing Moses this is a candlestick, okay, something he can perceive. And in First Chronicles 28 and 15, um, let's get that where it talks about, I believe, it, the lamps. Yeah, it talks about their lamps, which is what this is. 28 and 15 first chronicles chronicles 28 sorry my pages are sticking mm -hmm. 28 and 15 even the weight for the candlesticks of gold and for their lamps of gold by weight for every candlestick and for the lamps thereof and for the candlesticks of silver by weight, both for the candlestick and also for the lamps thereof, according to the use of every candlestick. And David <laughs> and David pulls out in Psalms 132 and 17, how, as Dr. Altman says, the point of the matter is light. This is a principle of light. That is like, is a lamp. So let's get that in Psalms 132 and 17. And 2 Samuel 22 and 29, the prophet Samuel also expounds from Moses' vision how the point of this lampstand is the light that Yahshua says he is that we read earlier, that he is truly the light in us and how it correlates to the seven branch uh, A order that Dr. Gene Burst we went over on Tuesday it points to the flickering of blood, the oxygenated blood, that gives light to the body. Psalms 132 and 17. 
There will I make the horn of David to bud. And I have ordained a lamp for my anointed. That's right. So he's referring to David as a lamp or knowing that that spirit in David is a light in him that gives him light. Let's read 2 Samuel 22 and 29. Because this furnishing is an ordained event. This was given to Moses in a divine vision revelation, and he was instructed to build it in the wilderness of Sinai. 2 Samuel 22 and 29. For thou art my lamp, O Yahweh, and Yahweh will lighten my darkness. That's right. So the principle is light. So hopefully some of that helps Dr. Samara Brass, I think is who had the, who brought the question up in looking at the distinction between the seven branch golden candlestick or the seven branch lampstand. It's the same. It's just understanding how you're going to talk about it. If you're going to talk about when it was built by one beating work was built as a candlestick and that the lamps were placed on the top with oil specific to, to burning a light that was lit at three in the evening and put out at nine in the morning to point to him being our light in our bodies. Hopefully that helps. Uh, uh, yes, I, I like I said, I was liking it candle to wax instead of oil. So I think that I was misunderstanding that a candle could be of oil. And it doesn't have to be wax, but that's what came to my mind. Okay. And Dr. Brass, I must say this, also in the old um, encyclopedias, I have read in one that any light, the stars, the moon that's reflected at night, the sun, any light can be called a lamp. Like I say, research it, honey, if it'll help. Okay. Right. Can you hear me? First. Yeah, I think she can. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Burrs. Okay. Thank okay. you. You're Thank welcome. you. So Dr. Manhoff, you're reading from John wrote in Revelations 11, 1, 2, 3, thusly. Let's finish reading that. And then we will be at the top of the hour. On page 71, body one. Mm -hmm. For John wrote in Revelation 11 and 1 through 3, thusly. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of Elohim and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and, you, and, and they you, shall and prophesy. Let me pause here. Let me pause here. And this is current. This is so current. So he's saying that holy city, which we know is Jerusalem, even then and now today, is doing what? It's treading. It's treading on the foot what he has done. You know, as I said before, knowing that the name Yahweh was given to Moses and he was instructed to declare it to the children of Israel and Egypt and, and it's being concealed is treading on what he has done for salvation knowing that this name Yahshua is the only name given among men whereby man must be saved and knowing that that name is just not pronounced Yahshua but understand that Yahshua we know is Yahweh who is our salvation in this body and that he is the true temple shown to Moses in this super anthropomorphic being. 
So we know this, and that is such a blessing today to know that we are not under the law of sin and death, because that's what this law brings, is death. It is a principle that was instituted to show in top and shadow that the Israelites, who it was given to only, could not perform it. Let's keep reading. How the holy city shall tread underfoot forty and two months. Mm -hmm. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And his witnesses, we know, is a law and a testimony. And we researched that in Daniel to see that the prophet Daniel, where the word came unto him and witnessed to him how this event must take place and how this death and this burial must follow a resurrection. Just at the end of this age, we are appointed to die once, but we know that we are in the power of his resurrection because of Pentecost, because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Read. In the new age, excuse me. I will give power unto my two witnesses, the law and the prophets. Read. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. In the new heaven and earth, I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh lo him almighty, and the Lamb are the temple of it. Revelations 21 and 22. And let's get that, and then we will be able to wrap up class after that. Revelations 21, 22. And he has an uppercase letters, and I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh, our Elohim, Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple of it. So we know that he has called us. He has bought us with a price. He says, know ye not, let's get that, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we are not of our own. Let's get that. And in Revelation 21, 22. That's 2 Corinthians 6 and 19. First Corinthians. That's, That's first Corinthians. Uh-huh. First Corinthians six and nineteen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of Yahweh, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify Yahweh in your body and in your spirit, which are his. That's right. And Revelation 21, 22, please. Revelation 21, 22. And I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh El Shaddai and the Lamb are the temple of it. That's right. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of Yahweh did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And we know before he showed Moses on that fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars, we know that there was light, cosmic light, as we can best understand it. We know that he himself is the source and the substance of all things. And so he's reconciling us back onto himself in light. And he calls the day, he calls the light day. So we're always happy to be in a good day here when we are called to class and to know that we're in the day of eternity and that he has redeemed us from that second death that was mentioned in this section. So that covers section arrow number one and arrow number 1A in the school text entitled Elohim, the archetype pattern, the archetype original pattern of the universe written by founder and being Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley. That section can be found on volume one page 70 and 71. Yahweh willing, we will continue in this volume with arrow number one uh, compared to 1A um, further on in comparing Moses and John's vision on page 71 that will continue on on tomorrow.
hopefully Yahweh willing, he will assemble us to continue to increase us in a better understanding of this divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley. I yield the floor to the moderator. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out to study with us today. Classes are held Tuesday through Friday, 11 o'clock a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will now end class with the doxology taken from the last two verses of the Book of Jude, Holy Name Version. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Through the only wise and only him, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say together, Hallelujah. 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 Great class. Beautiful class. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, bless you.